everybody. Dr. Rick Wallace dropping in on you. Hope that you guys have gotten your week off to a great start. It has been an extremely busy weekend for me and the family. Uh, got to help a friend celebrate, celebrate the uh, release of his first book. I th that was very exciting for me because I've watched his uh, progression in life and I've seen him move through challenges and I'm extremely proud of the young brother. Uh, I'm also uh, excited about the things that we're doing here. Uh, before I get off into today's uh, video, I want to remind you that if you are looking to seriously commit to changing your life, to making a calibration on the direction you're headed in, the path you're taking, uh, to ultimately change the results you're getting. Uh, now is your time to do that. You've asked for it. For those of you who asked for it, for those of you who, for whatever reason, did not want to or could not take advantage of the normal uh, programs that I offer, which are 12 weeks and higher, those of you who asked for a more condensed, more uh, affordable option, the Savage in Six is here. Savage in Six is, stands for Savage in Six Weeks. It is literally a six-week intensified program working with yours truly that will allow you to literally change the trajectory of your life and put you on a path to unparalleled success. I don't care who you are, where you're coming from, what you've been through, what you've seen, what people have told you. If you desire to change your life, you can change your life. If you desire to elevate your life, you can elevate your life. Now, please understand, this is not something that happens because you wish it to happen. This is not about a wish factor. This isn't about ease. This is about commitment. But if you are committed to changing your life, and for those of you who literally came to me and said, hey, doc, I would love to work with you, but 12 weeks to 52 weeks and all that stuff in between is a little much for me and I may not be able to afford it. Whatever it was that you didn't want to do 12 weeks, 18 weeks, 26 weeks or 52 weeks, here is six weeks. The Savage in Six is here. And if you want to, the uh, link to uh, enroll is in the description box. If you're ready to make a move and change your life and you have to be seriously committed. I don't work with people who are not committed because my goal is to help people change their life. My time is valuable. And I've made this for people who have been coming to me and saying, look, I can't do that, but I would really love to. Here's your chance. Now, with that out of the way, look, I'm going to be real, real with you. This is going to be real quick. It's going to be real. Bright. It's probably not going to make a lot of people comfortable because I'm not here to offer you excuses. I'm not here to stroke you. I'm not here to collar you. I'm not here. to. Now, I will inspire you. I will encourage you. I will lift you up. I definitely will do that. I will talk to you in encouraging ways. I will never disparage you, but I'm not going to lift the burden of your responsibility off your shoulders because that's there because God placed it there. The most high has an expectation. Let me explain something to you. I want you to explain something because you need to explain. You need to understand this so that you can understand what I'm about to tell you. Now, God's gift to you is simple. People look at it in a million different ways. All this, It's real simple. God gave you a talent, a gift, potential. It's called potential. And this potential uh, is in and of itself immensely powerful. But th that's this thing. You can work the potential. You can hone the potential. You can train the potential. You can develop the potential. And it expands. And it can expand infinitely. There's no limit to what you can do with your potential. It's all about how much you put into your potential. Now, that's God's gift to you. Let me tell you about what your gift to God is. Your gift to God is what you do with the potential. Your gift to God is how much you develop it, how much you put. At the end of the day, it's going to be a reconciliation between the designer and the design. And it's going to be, what did you do with what I gave you? And your answer to God, no matter what your faith is, no matter where you come from, you're going to have to be able to give an account of what you did with the gift. And so if you haven't done what you should be doing with the gift, that's on you. Now, the gift does not guarantee that there won't be challenges. The gift does not guarantee that there won't be setbacks. The gift does not guarantee that you will not be born into a family full of dysfunction. The gift does not guarantee that you will not be born into poverty. None of that comes with the gift. The gift simply says that no matter where you arrive, you arrive with the potential to rise. And your responsibility at the end of the day is to overcome it all. Because here's the thing. 
when you come out, the darker the thing you come out of, the greater the testimony, the greater the representation, the greater of your representation of the gift and the greater the representation of the gift, the greater the representation of the giver. And so that is how we represent God, by how we live our lives, by how we make an impact in this world. And then the darker the place you come from, the greater the representation. So coming from a bad place is not an excuse. It should be a motivating factor because there's a story behind what you've been through. Trust me, I've been there. I know what it's like to come from darkness. I know what it's like to never know your father. I know what it's like to have questions about what's wrong with me that he doesn't want anything to do with me. I'm When I say I didn't know my father, I want you to understand something. When I wrote my first book, The Invisible Father, Re Reversing the Curse of a Fatherless Generation, that came from an article my journalism teacher, who happened to be the wife of my one of my football coaches, uh, encouraged me to write in, in in high school. I think in the eleventh grade, and it was entitled "Reverse." Uh, it was entitled simply "The Invisible Father," but it was dealing with absentee fatherhood. She knew I had never met my father. Now, at the time, my journalism teacher came, journalism teacher came into my life. My father had already passed. The first time I saw my father was at his funeral. Now, uh, don't get me wrong. I had this unbelievably awesome great grandfather. My grandmother's parents reared me. So I had a man in the house, but it still didn't uh, eradicate my concerns and, and needs to understand what was going on with my father. Now, I've never disparaged my father. I've never had a negative thing to say outside of telling the truth that I never, ever knew him. Uh, now, here's the thing, though. That's just a part of it. And there's this, there's this you know, thing that goes on. And what I can tell you is behind every challenge, there's a reward for perseverance and you have to be willing to push it. Now, let me talk to you. Uh, the thing is, this promise of your potential, this promise of your relationship with the most high with God, this promise that says there are some things out there for you, this promise cannot just simply be set on. The promise can't simply be there for you to wait on. The promise must be possessed. If you look at the uh, greatest promise in the Bible, if you want to do that, the God's promise to Abraham was that he would be the father of many nations, that his people would possess this unbelievable land. When it came time to possess the land, they had to do just that. They had the deed to it, but they didn't own, they didn't possess it. They had the paper, but they didn't own it. It was God's gift to them, but they didn't own it yet because they needed to go in and possess it. And there was this big issue with possessing it that caused the whole entire generation to miss out on the promise. So what am I telling you is that there are some things out there for your life that you were designed for. You were designed for greatness. God didn't design anybody for mediocrity. God didn't design anybody to be average. You were designed for greatness, but here's the thing. You got to possess it. You've got to literally go and possess it. One of the problems with most people is that they're sitting around waiting on their breakthrough to happen. No, you got to go out and participate. Your breakthrough, the very definition of the word breakthrough demands action. It's you doing something to break through something. Your breakthrough comes at the point in which you actually achieve the thing you've been working towards. Breakthrough is never achieved by idly sitting by waiting on God to do it for you. God didn't design you that way. God designed you to be a person in motion, in action. Matter of fact, the very definition and movement of faith says there has to be action because James, the brother of Jesus, sit up and told you that faith without works is dead. Then he followed up and said, you can say you have faith without works, but I'll show you my faith by my works. You will know what I believe by watching what I do. Did you get that? You will understand the things I believe in by watching what I, you can tell what I believe about marriage by watching how I treat my wife. You don't, if you are able to observe my relationship with my wife in any shape, form or fashion, you will be able to discern what my beliefs are about marriage, what I believe and feel about my wife. You'll be able to see it in my actions. When you're truly walking out your faith, you don't have to talk about it a whole lot. I tell people all the time, your greatest testimony is the life you live, not the one you give when you're at church or wherever it is you give it. Your greatest testimony is people to be able to look at you and say, man, that should have took him out. Or that should have took her out. Man, that should have broke her. But look, she's squaring her shoulders up. That should have went through it. I don't know if this sister is still on here, but I know uh, if she is, 
uh, I, I want to talk about it because this is a representation of what I'm talking about, about breakthrough, about faith, about uh, uh, possessing the promise. Uh, Queen Chaco, uh, if you're still on there, uh, much love, much respect. I know that you went through a battle with breast cancer. And I've seen so many battles with cancer. I've seen so many people succumb to it, but I've seen so many people triumph. And what I'm going to tell you is you got to go in and possess it. That's something about a true faith that creates an environment for healing. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. See, see, a lot of people are talk faith, but they they not really walk in it. And you can see it in the results of their life. And then they're frustrated because they don't get it. And then they're upset with God. But no, you're not walking. See, you, you, you got the ritual down, but you don't have the practice. See, there's a difference between the ritualistic movements and the practice that follows relationship. But if you want the breakthrough, you're going to have to possess the promise. You're going to have to literally go in and take the promise. You're going to have to decide this is mine. I'm fighting for it and I'm not going to relinquish it because it belongs to me. I'm not going to let anybody, any dark force, any negative idea, thought come in and snatch it out of my hands. I will fight ferociously, mentally, emotionally, psychologically, and physically to protect that which I have claimed as my own and nobody has the right to take it, but I've got to fight for it. I've got to possess it. There's nothing going to be easy about anything worth having in this world. You're going to have to possess it. You're going to have to go out and take it. You're going to have to take some bumps and bruises. You're going to have to deal with some delays, some disappointments, some frustrations. You're going to have to sit up and really prove to God in this universe, in this life, that you definitely want it. And you're going to do that by being resilient, by being forceful, by being by being expectant. I tell people all the time. God, the universe, life only meets you at the level of your expectations. You can talk a good game, but whatever you truly expecting is where you're going to meet at. Uh, for those who uh, study the Bible, for those of you who read the Bible, for those of you who claim Christianity, Judaism, those of you who claim Islam, let's go talk about this story back at the Jordan River. Let's talk about not willing to go over and possess the promise. This is where I'm going to bring things to a head and I'm going to close it out. I'm almost done. Let's go back and talk about this. Now, we're talking about this in principle. Don't get so caught up on whether it happened, how it happened and all. Let's talk about the principle because there's a principle here and you can find this principle that plays out in almost every story in life. So I like this principle because most people know the story to some degree. So here it is. There, there's this whole thing. They're brought out of Egypt. Moses brings them out of Egypt and they're sitting there at the Jordan and they send over these spies to go check out. And now the two of these spies is Caleb and Joshua. Now, Caleb and Joshua will ultimately be the only two of their generation to go over. And there's a reason for this, right? They go over, 12 spies come back and they all agree that it was everything that God said it would be unbelievably beautiful, flowing with milk and honey and all that, whatever milk and honey flowing with looks like. It was flowing with milk and honey. So here it is. It's happening, right? All this stuff. But here's the thing. They noticed that the land was occupied. Other people were already living there. In other words, if you want to talk about it, people were squatting on their stuff. People were squatting on it, but they were there. And by the looks of it, had been there forever. But here they come and that God is telling them to go and possess it. And then there's a certain way that God's woman. God said they're on your land. You're going to have to take it. And because I don't want any of their toxicity, any of their paganism, any of that stuff infiltrating what I am planning in you, you got to kill them all. So then when they come back, 10 say, yeah, it's flowing with milk and honey, but there are giants over there. And we're like grasshoppers in their sight. It's no way we can go over there and win wars with these people. But two of them said, hey, yeah, they are giants, but if God said we can possess it, we can possess it. See, that's the thing about life. You're going to be facing some giants in this life, but God said it was yours. The promise is yours. The thing that you're chasing is yours. You're going to have a giant of delay. You're going to have a giant of opposition. You're going to have giants of setbacks and frustrations and financial disappointments. Those are the giants, but you've got to go in and possess it. Anyway, here's the thing, though, when it gets real interesting, because I'm trying to get a point across it gets to the point where they decide, you know, no, no, they start bickering. Matter of fact, they get to the point they ready to about kill Moses. And then God calls Moses to the side to talk to him. And, 
And this is the thing. When I've studied this, I looked at it over and over. I've done all types of exegesis on it, uh, used all my uh, hermeneutic skills trying to break this down and look at this thing. And it, it, it boils down to actually being real simple. You just have to take time to slow down and read it and understand it. Here it says, the first thing that blew my mind is God says, I've heard their complaints against me. Tell them that I've heard their complaints against me. So I'm going back now. I'm trying to find where they're complaining against God. The truth is they never actually personally complain against God. But check this out. What do they do? What do they do? They never actually complain against God, but they sit up and say they can't. But God had already told them they can't. So God saw the absence of their faith in him as a complaint against him. I said, you can do it. You said you can't. So he saw that as a complaint, a direct um, uh, indictment of his divine power, divine nature, and his word. So then he said, wait a minute. So, so go back and tell him I heard their complaints against me. But he doesn't stop there. Now, this is the part you got to pay attention to. He says, tell them as they have spoken in my hearing, so shall I do to them. Whatever you speak, you declare. Whatever you declare, you establish. It's, it, it's done in your subconscious. It's done in the universe. And what happens the moment you speak it, you manifest it. It doesn't manifest in the third dimension immediately, but it manifests in the fifth dimension. It's a spiritual warfare being waged. Whether you believe in God or anything else, I'm telling you that if you don't understand that you're operating in more than just a physical body, that there are spiritual elements, you can literally measure your spiritual energy. And how that energy flows is going to create a certain frequency and vibration that's going to determine what you can draw to you and what you cannot. You cannot heal in your body little physical illnesses with envy, strife, jealousy, anger, frustration, bitterness, all of those things that function at a roughly about a 200 to 250 hertz level. Literally, you can measure it when somebody's angry, when somebody's frustrated, when somebody's being envious, when somebody's bitter. All those things are down at 250 and below. That's happening for real. It's a spiritual energy. But when you step up into the place of gratitude, when you make up in your mind, no matter what, I'm going to be thankful. Guess what happens? First and foremost, you go from 250 down here with all this crap up to 500 plus. Then you sit up and say, you know what? I'm going to walk in love. And I don't mean this little emotional, uh, infatuated stuff. I'm talking about a love that comes with a commitment of behavior. I'm going to treat people with kindness. I'm going to demand that I be treated with kindness. I'm going to walk in a place where I expect kindness to be in my atmosphere, in my environment. Guess what? 550, 600. Then I say, you know what? There are some things that I don't know yet that God wants me to know. I'm going to go out and grow and discover something greater every day. 750. Now you're moving in the area of divine revelation. This is where you get to communicate hey, with God through energy. And God will reveal to you, those are where the answers to your problems and your solutions come. But guess what? The moment you hit the 550 from gratitude and all that, the entire environment of how your body responds to your environment changes. This is where healing takes place. God designed you to heal. God designed you to heal. That's why some people win the battle in whatever disease they're fighting. Some people don't. God designed you to heal. That's why you can go to certain places where there isn't all this toxicity and all this uh, ritualism without any understanding of true practice of faith. And you find people healing. And, and then you find, here's the thing, though. It's not the healer, it's the person being healed. And I'll prove a point to you. For those, again, who study their Bibles, check this out. But you can check this out in anything where you study history, but check this out because there are faith healers outside of the realm of Christianity, if we're going to be honest about it. But let's just take the Bible. Every time that Jesus performed a miracle of healing, what did he follow it with? By your faith, ye were healed. By your faith, you were healed. And so what is it? And, and it also tells you that in the place where Jesus came from, there weren't many miracles done. Why? Because the people didn't believe. They saw the carpenter's child. They saw a little Jesus, the little kid running around growing up. They, they couldn't possibly fathom something as powerful 
as a supernatural healer in that little kid. So they didn't believe in where there is no faith and no belief. It doesn't matter who's in the room. That's why you can't understand why something ain't happening. God's not absent. God's always present. Where is your faith? I'm not talking about mystical stuff right now. I'm not put that mystical. I'm talking about the faith that makes you move. The faith that says, you know what? I'm going to step out here. I'm going to walk out here. I'm going to go out and I'm going to actually do something about starting my business. I'm going to actually do something about changing my financial situation. I'm going to actually do something about strengthening my marriage. I'm going to actually do it. I'm going to understand that I can pray all day. But if I'm not taking action to actually fulfill and, and possess the promise, it doesn't matter. You are going to have to possess the promise. Well, God sits up and tells them, you know what? Tell them as they have spoken in my hearing. That's that stuff. Your self-talk. Watch what you're speaking on your life. In, in, in the book of Job, it, it, it says you shall declare a thing and it shall be established. And, and, and life is proven that. Psychology is proven that. If you sit up and you keep talking it, you keep speaking it, you're literally programming your subconscious to carry it out. And here's the thing, though. Your subconscious doesn't have the ability to distinguish, number one, between what's being imagined and what's real. Number two, it doesn't have uh, uh, the lack of neutrality. It is neutral, meaning that whatever you sit up and say, it's not sitting up and filtering and going, well, that's not a good thing you're talking about. So I know you don't want it. It just it talks about it a lot. So it's got to be what we're focused on. So you can literally say, man, I'm, I'm so broke. I'm so this. I'm so that. Subconscious, okay, that's where we at. That's how we're gonna behave. That's how we're gonna make our decision. We're gonna and broke people make different decisions than people who are wealthy, people who are rich, people who are financially liberated. You got to start speaking as that thing that is not as though it were. And people are gonna tell you, you're faking it till you make it. You can call it what you want to, but I'm not gonna talk darkness on my life. I'm not gonna let a circumstance or a situation dictate to me what my outcome is gonna be. I'm gonna speak the outcome, not the circumstance. Matter of fact, when I was going through the most difficult time of my life some years ago, now I can't believe that it's been that long, but when I sit back and I look and I'm going through this point and the, there, there were very few people that I even shared it with, but there was a couple of people that knew and they were like, you're in denial. I'm saying, why do you think I'm in denial? Some of you've heard this story. So why do you think I'm in denial? Because I see you and you're smiling. You're out there serving the homeless. You're out there doing this and doing that. And I'm watching you and I know where you're at and I know what you're going through. And I know it's got to be eating you up. And 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 and, and but but you 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 you're walking around smiling. And I said, I'm not, it does me no good to sit around and bask in my moment if my moment isn't something to celebrate. What I decide to do is I'm going to live in the vision of my destiny. So while I'm operating in my moment, I'm living in the future results of my faithfulness of walking out my purpose despite my situation. So what you see is somebody smiling because I'm here in the body, but my spirit is somewhere else. And here's something else I can tell you. I have a real true relationship with God, not anything based on. I'm talking about me and God talking, communicating ways that I didn't even know was possible 20 years ago. And I'm saying I'm in here and I'm in this space. So guess what? I have a direct line, my spirit to God's spirit, and we sitting up and we're communicating. And guess what happens? I see in my flesh, in the natural human state, my problem. Let's call it a circumstance. My circumstance isn't what I want it to be. But I'm also at the very same time communicating on a constant basis with God. And the spirit of God is communicating to me who I really am and confirming with me that I'm not what my moment dictates. I am what my destiny and my identity dictates. And what does that mean? It means that there is now something in my spirit that disagrees with my circumstances. Something in my spirit disagrees. That says I override the moment. I tell people all the time of this and they can't get it because it doesn't make scientific sense or it doesn't make practical sense. I won't say scientific because you can prove some crazy stuff with science right now, but I, it, won't, it doesn't make practical tell people all the time. Look, faith transcends facts. The moment you start to understand that faith will take the fact that you just got a positive result back in from the doctor that shook you. Faith will transcend the fact. I'm telling you what I know. 
I'm telling you that you can be so connected with God and operate at such a high frequency that your body will start to heal itself. Your body doesn't need anything but to be in the right environment. Remove all toxic environments, remove all carcinogens, get all the negative thoughts out of your mind. Your body will start to take care of itself. That is the power of faith, but you've got to possess it. What I can tell you is you can't win stressed out. I'm going to tell you, you gain nothing by stressing but to become ill and to become frustrated. Because here's what happens when you stress. All of the things your mind can come up and create with comes from either the right side of the brain, the creative side, the left side of the brain is the constructive reasoning, rational eye, impulse control, all that stuff that helps you make decisions. But it's a combination of those working together. But check out this thing. When you go into a state of stress, the body panics. You go into a heightened state of physical alertness. It's called the fight or flight response. Now, back thousands of years ago when you were walking out into the wilderness and there was all kind of crazy animals out there trying to kill you and you had to go out and hunt and bring back the food to feed the kids and the, and the my wife in the, in the cave, this was a great thing to have because the hair, when, when, when danger was around before you could even see it, the hairs on your neck would stand up. It would alert you something's going on. So then your physical alertment would go up. The body would release cortisol and adrenaline into the bloodstream. Now you're able to fight if you have to or run if you have to at speeds and strengths that you would not normally have. It's not meant to last for long, just long enough to win the fight or to get away. But what happens when those things are no longer there? Now you're stressing over things like money, stressing over things about what somebody said about you, stressing because you're going to a job that you can't stand and you are sitting up working for pay you're not satisfied with, but you're still stressing. And now you've got that adrenaline flowing through your system and that cortisol, after, it, after it's been there two or three minutes, it starts to work against you. After it's been there 30 minutes, it's starting to attack the body. And then you're talking about chronic stress where you're stressed out weeks at a time. Kidneys are suffering, heart is suffering, liver is suffering. You, uh, a lot of this, you're talking about, it's not just your diet that's causing diabetes. It's your stress. It's not just your diet that's causing coronary heart disease. It's your stress. It's not just diet that's causing ischemic heart disease. It's your stress. It's not just your diet that's causing you to have trouble losing weight. It's stress. Stress will tear up the entire metabolic process. You have to understand what's going on and what you're dealing with, but you got to come at it from a position of faith. This is how I start my day. I start my day by saying real simple, I'm grateful. And then I look for three things for which I have to be grateful. Uh, at this time in my life, I'm real blessed because I don't have to think hard for the first one. I just simply look over. I'm laying on my back. I look over to my left, and there she is. I watch her take her first breath. I smile, and I say thank you. The greatest blessing I have. I haven't even gotten out to bed, and I've already saw the first thing. Then I think about my kids, and, 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 and one side of me wants to say, God, why? But the truth is, God had to really trust me to bless me with all these kids. So I, I'm, I'm grateful because that's a vote of confidence. Man, imagine getting a vote of confidence from God. I say, hey, if I gave it to you, I trust you with it. The problem is, what can God trust you with? One of the most profound questions uh that i have ever had to ponder was posed by a relative of mine at my stepmother's funeral and it was after reading uh the first chapter of job and the question was can god trust you with trouble hmm. can god trust you with trouble if he can't, you can't get the promise because 
The promise is going to require you to move through some trouble. The promise is going to require you to move through some fear. The promise is going to require you to move through some trepidation and, 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 and some things. The, the, the promise is going to make a demand. Here's the thing I tell people all the time. Then I'm done. Life will pray. Life will pay. God will deliver anything you demand with the right intention. But here's the thing. God the universe, life is going to make a counter demand. What does that mean? That means that when you make the demand on life, life is going to say, okay, but you're going to have to do this in order to have it. If you want to improve your relationship with your wife, you're going to have to stop going out with your boys three times a week. You're going to have to make that maybe once a month. You're going to have to spend more quality time with her. You're going to have to listen to her. Uh, if you want to work on with your husband, you can't grind and beat on him about everything he's doing. He's going to need you to support him in the vision. He's going to need you to hear the vision. He's going to need you to help him birth it. He's going to need that from you. If you want to change your financial situation, you can't buy everything you see on TV. You can't sit up and keep up in a race with the Joneses. you got to start learning how to build instead of spend. That's what life is going to say. It's not going to magically happen because you say you want it. It's not going to magically happen because you pray for it. It's going to require you take action. You're going to have to go in. You're going to have to go in and possess it. You know, when that, when that question was asked, man, it's been 16 years. But when that question was asked, it stuck with me because see, nobody wants to talk about trouble. The moment that it's a bunch of people coming to me, but the moment I start talking about, man, you're going to do this, you're going to do this. Whoa, 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 whoa. See, people want to think, OK, if I change my speech, if I change my thinking, thinking, that means I'm going to have no. I wake up with gratitude every morning. I wake up with a set mind. I wake up with the right mindset and I meet challenges every day. I have to move through challenge. It doesn't remove the challenges, but it does change how you approach them. It does change what you expect when you meet them. It does change the level of your confidence. You are going to have to walk through it. Even Will Smith said this. Will Smith said he believed that God put everything worth having on the other side of fear. Fear will paralyze you. I'm here to tell you that no matter how you see what we call the devil, the, the devil's greatest weapon is fear. So many people are being manipulated and controlled because of fear. You'll be surprised what you can do in this world when you refuse to succumb to fear. Think about everybody that you admire that has historical significance, whether it's Malcolm, whether it's Markham, whether it's Marcus Garvey, whether whoever it is, I guarantee you that was a point in which you can look at their lives and say, man, they overcame fear. They had to really sit down. Martin talks about it. Martin talked about it in his memoirs, a time where he literally was sitting out at night and the phone rings and it's people talking about they're going to burn his house down. They're going to kill his family, all this stuff like this. And he's sitting there and he's going, wait a minute. He says he gets out of the bed and goes in the kitchen and makes a cup of coffee, sits down at the kitchen table. And he's literally talking, God, I, ain't, I don't want to die. But see, in order for Martin to be the Martin we know, Martin had to walk through that fear. Malcolm had to do it. Megar Evers had to do it. A lot of our parents had to do it. And if you're going to live in the area of greatness, you're going to have to walk through it. I can help you get there with what I do, but ultimately you're going to have to make a commitment that no matter what, I tell people all the time, it's not the degrees. It's not even the experience. You know what makes me a winner? I don't quit. It's a bunch of time. Not life knocked me flat on my back. Hmm. But I refused to stay down. I got up. And then I had a conversation with God that was real simple that most people don't even understand. Didn't ask God to get, get me out of it. I, I wasn't whining and crying. Oh, I can't deal with it. Please get now. I'm like, hey, here we go again. And my simple thing, if you wake me up, I'll answer the bill. That's my That's my agreement with you. Wake me up and watch me. That's what I told God. Wake me up and watch me. 
You already planted the gift in me. If you go back and you watch David, when he goes out on the field as a 15 year old kid and everybody's cowering at the sight of Goliath, if you notice, there's no point where David has to go off in a corner and play and pray to God and ask God, is this what you want me to do? He walked out there with confidence from day one. Why? God had already took him through the process. See, most of y'all don't want to go through the process. See, God had already took him. See, he said, no, I, I've already killed lions and bears. <laughs> this dude right here is going to be just like that. I'm going out there and handle this. Well, you know, try on this armor. No, 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 no. I got a whole different type on it. I try this to so cumbersome. I'm going to go out there with no armor. I'm going straight out there and handle this. How could he possibly do that? It's because he already knew he had been through. He was prepared. What he, In my words, what I tell myself every time I'm about to face this, I'm built for this. So that's what I told God. I'm built for this. All I need you to do is not let me die. Wake me up every morning and watch me. I'm going to answer the bell. I'm going to walk this thing out. And when I need revelation, I'll come to you. And that's what, what I'm seeking answers. And I need guidance. I'm going to come to you. But I don't want no supernatural delivery. I want to walk it out because somebody out there needs to see me overcoming. Somebody will be blessed because I refuse to quit. You got to possess it. I'm going to leave you with that. Like I said, if those who want to take advantage of the uh, Savage in Six, it's down there in the uh, description box. But whatever you do, you got to walk it out. Your breakthrough requires your participation. You can't sit idly by and experience a breakthrough. Breakthrough by its very definition say you are breaking through something. You are finally coming through what you've been working hard to get done. You can't sit and break through anything. You got to be moving to break through. That's my challenge to you. I'm ready to get out of here. It is up to you. You're going to have challenges. Trust me. Even if you sit idle and try to hide in a corner of comfort, you're going to have challenges. You're not going to escape them. The difference is, are you going to triumph in your challenge? Or are you going to be defeated? That's up to you. On that note, I'm out of here. You have an unbelievable day. Hey everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace dropping in on you. I uh, hope that you guys had a great week this past week. I hope that you're having an unbelievable and awesome weekend. I'm not going to be long. I just wanted to stop by because I'm excited about the direction that we're traveling in. I'm excited about what we are doing at the Visionetics Institute, what we're doing at Rick Wallace Enterprises, period. I'm excited about it. We're making some major uh, turns. Uh, we're making some major leaps in progress. Uh, definitely experiencing some um, growing pains, but I would rather be experiencing growing pains than uh, feeling as if my efforts were being emaciated in the, in the way of results. So I'm excited. We're pushing. And I just wanted to stop by and talk to you about uh, something I've been working on for over three years. And we are finally releasing it. Uh, I had just created a program called the Bronze Mini, which is basically like half of a bronze session. Uh, but right now, I want to tell you about Savage in Six Weeks. Savage in Six Weeks is actually the result of numerous requests from uh, potential clients and people who are in interested in how I operate and what I teach and what I do for my clients. And they wanted something more compact. They wanted something more intense, something more affordable. And I normally ask my clients to commit to a minimum of 12 weeks. In fact, most of my clients are operating on a 52 week program, which is a year. Uh, I like to work. I like to be intensive. I like to be comprehensive. I like to be fully engaged in helping my clients achieve what it is they're looking for. And success isn't an overnight endeavor. It takes time. A lot of the thinking and the beliefs and the limiting ideas and beliefs that people hold are holding them back. And you don't change those overnight. And so it is a process of development, a process of growth. And I like to do it the right way. So over the last three years, I've been saying, how can I uh, make it more concise, but still make it effective? How can I be able to talk to someone, determine what goals they have in mind, determine what it is that they want to do, and then 
uh, design and devise a plan that can be executed in six weeks. And so that was the challenge. Oh, that's a lot you can do. I've had unbelievable success with people with 30 days. I've had unbelievable success with someone with one uh, session, but we're not talking about just a, a breakthrough in ideas, a breakthrough in thoughts. We're talking about literally sitting up, sitting up and acknowledging first and foremost that I'm not where I want to be. I'm not, and I'm not talking about not where I want to be in the sense of, man, I've been doing this unbelievable thing. I'm great, but there's another level. Uh, that's a different thing. Everybody should be striving for that next level. I wake up every morning striving to be a better person than I was the day before. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who are literally in a place where they are not happy, literally in a place where they know there's more, but they don't know how to get there, or they are afraid to take the steps to get there. People who are literally at a place where they don't want this to be the story of their life. Uh, there are people I work with that were exceptional when they came to me, but they knew it was another level. They wanted to go there. This isn't what this is about. Uh, there's a place for that. And the people who want to work with me, uh, there's, there's plenty of opportunity to do that. I'm talking about people that I should have, when talking about uh, achieving success, I hear four more excuses of why it can't be done. Uh, or why it's not possible, then I see people taking proactive action. That's my concern. So many people that have so much potential, and every last one of you have potential, so many people who have potential, but are convinced for whatever reason that uh, suffering is their lot in life, poverty is their lot in life, loneliness is their lot in life, uh, working for someone else their entire life is their lot in life. I'm not sitting up... Uh, uh, maligning anyone who has a job. If you have a job and you love your job, good for you. If you have a job and you're fulfilled at your job, good for you. You determine what success means in your life. Success doesn't always have to mean working for yourself. I'm personally a person that loves the control I have at being my own boss. I love the control I have of being able to expand myself at a pace that I'm comfortable with. And when I say comfortable, I don't mean comfortable in the sense of relaxed. I mean that I get to move at the fastest rate possible for me. That's comfortable. When I'm really pushing myself is when I'm, nobody can sit up and say, you can't do that today. No, we, we're not going to even go for that today. We'll do that some other time. I never have to hear that. When I decide I want to do something, I can make up in my mind that I'm going to do it. And then it's all steam. It's all, uh, full steam ahead from that point. Sometimes I get there fast. Sometimes I don't get there uh, when I think I should, but I'm committed enough and I understand the process enough never to quit on my vision, never to quit on my dream. So I eventually get there and I and I help people understand how to do that. But I, I, I hear so many excuses. I'm afraid of failure. What people? What are people going to say? What are people going to think? You know, what will my family think? What if I fail? What if I fall flat on my face? And the thing is, you'll never know if you don't try, first and foremost. Number two, stop allowing people who have very little invested in you to have such a massive impact on how you move, how you think, and how you operate. Because if the people were really, truly in work operating your interests, they will be supporting you. They will be encouraging you. They will see the gift in you. They will see the potential in you. They will be literally challenging you to step out from behind that uh, that veneer that holds you into this position or this corner of comfort and step out into the world. Yeah, you're going to take risks, but risks that are calculated, risks that when you apply yourself will be minimal in how they negatively impact you, but you're going to get some bumps and bruises. I tell people all the time, if I defined my life, uh, there are a bunch of ways I could do it, but one of the ways I define my life is I have made my mark and there were times that life made its mark on me. What does that mean? You're going to get scars. You're going to get bru bruises. You're going to have some ups and downs. You're going you're gonna to make your mark if you're set out to make a mark and if you're committed to make a mark. But you're going to get marked up too. And the problem is too many people are afraid to be marked up. Too many people are afraid of taking the bumps and bruises. The problem is you spend the entire life waking up in the morning, going to a job you hate. You spend your entire life waking up in the morning, doing something you're not passionate about, you're not fulfilled about. And all you're doing is surviving. All you're doing is existing. And I, if it bothers you, you're the people I'm talking to. I'm not talking to the people who wake up and do that and they think that's it. That's what I'm supposed to do. And you're good with it. You're not ready to deal with me. I want to deal with the people who know this ain't for me. I don't like it. I'm doing it because the bills need to be paid. This ain't for me. I don't like it, but it's better than being alone. 
This ain't for me. I know that I could start my own business. I know I could actually do what I'm doing at this place for myself. This is the people. These are the people that I'm trying to reach. These are the people that I literally designed this program for. This program is to sit up and say, hey, look, here's my vision. Here's my dream. This is how I'm going to quantify my vision and my dream, because once I quantify it, I now have it in a measurable uh, component to where I can see my steps, see my movement, determine what I need to do. And how can we do that in six weeks? I divide, I, de, I de, uh, devise, designed a program that does exactly that. This is only for people who are committed. This is only for people who are ready to go all out. This is highly intensive. It is. It requires commitment. And yes, you're going to get out of your comfort zone literally immediately. You're not going to be able to sit back and say, "Well, this is what I really feel." okay with no it's not about what you're okay with doing it's not about what it's not about what you're comfortable doing it's about what's necessary are you really ready to take your life to the next level are you really ready to start living your life at the level of your design that's what savage in six weeks is about it is replacing the bronze mini package in my in 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 the packages that i offer it is six weeks of this is who I am. This is where I'm at. That's where I'm going. Let's get there. And it is proven methodology that will get you. There's so much that has to change, but we're going to get you started. We're going to get you in the right way. We're going to get the momentum built and we're going to launch you in the direction of your destiny that you have set for yourself. Not what someone else gave you, not what someone else told you uh, was your limits, not something that has held you back all this time, but what you sit up and decide in your life you want to do. And then you go out there and you do it. Am I saying it's going to be easy? I'm promising you it's not. But what I'm telling you, it will be fulfilling. Now, if you're serious about it and you want to do it, there's a link in the box. Click the link. You can read a little bit more. You can sign up. Once you sign up, you'll receive an email from the support team at the Visionetics Institute to gather more information from you to set you up with your first meeting with me. And then we're going to go out and we're going to change your life. On that note, I'm out of here. I'm looking forward to working with the people who are really serious about changing their life. If that person is you, I look forward to hearing from you. I'm out.